Hello there. My name is Minister Barton Aaron Porter, and today we're going to go into our Father's Word for another exciting Bible study. Now, I'm going to be using the good old King James Version of the Holy Bible, as I always do. So I encourage you to get your Bibles out and to study along with me. Let's approach our Heavenly Father's throne with a word of prayer before we get into this video. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we come with bowed heads and humble hearts, confessing our many sins, Lord, asking that you forgive us, wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the Savior of the world. We put all our hope and trust in that precious blood he shed for us at Calvary, Lord. And we ask right now, Almighty God, that you fill us with your precious Holy Spirit as we go into your word, the Holy Bible. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we thank you, Almighty God, for hearing our prayer. Amen. The title of today's Bible study is, We Don't Have to Live a Life of Sin. People have been misled to think because they were born with the law of sin in them, that they can't help but sin. They got to sin sometimes. And the title of this Bible study is, We Don't Have to Live a Life of Sin. So we're going to learn from the scripture that we don't have to, regardless of the fact that we were handicapped at birth with the law of sin because of the failure of Adam and Eve. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 20, Solomon wrote, For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. And so that's why people believe I got to sin sometimes because of verses like this. 1 John chapter 1 verse 8 to 10, the apostle John wrote, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now, this is a fact. So if you say, I don't never sin, or I don't have any sin, he says the truth is not in you. The law of sin will always be in our bodies, trying to get us to do the works of the flesh until the day we die. But we're going to learn from Scripture how God has given us the power to not give in to their wicked demands, all right? But that law of sin is always a part of your makeup. So that's why you cannot say you have no sin. Again, John says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, having the law of sin in your body is one thing, but giving into it or practicing sin is a, a, another thing entirely. Anyway, when we do come up short, and we all have, he says in verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see that? So that's how you get cleaned up. You know, you don't try to make any excuse when you yielded to that sin, whatever it was. It could be just a thought, an evil thought. You're lusting after some woman that's not your spouse or a woman lusting after some man that's not her spouse. That's a sin. So that's why I always ask God for forgiveness because sometimes you commit sins and you don't even realize you committed a sin. And that way you make sure you're covered. But we're going to learn that we don't have to live a life of sin. Anyway, he says in verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So when people read this, sometimes they say, well, see, we, we're born in sin. We, we, we just got to do it, man, no matter what. We just got to sin sometimes. Well, we're going to learn that that's not the case. The Apostle Paul spoke of his struggle with the law of sin in Romans chapter 7. I'm going to start at verse 18. He says, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, in his body, in other words, dwelleth no good thing. Now, this is the mighty man of God, the apostle that the Lord used to write the majority of the New Testament letters. Look what Paul says. He says, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not, Paul says. He says in verse 19, 
For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. 20. Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Now a lot of people misunderstand what Paul was talking about here. He says in verse 21, I find in the law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Uh, that was 21, 22. He says, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. 23. But I see another law in my members, his body members he's talking about, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. And then he says in verse 24, O wretched man that I am. Then he says, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And then he answers in verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. So when people read these verses, they, they're thinking Paul is saying, no matter what, we do, we just have to live a life of sin. And we're going to see as we continue, that is not what he was saying at all. He was just teaching us about the reality of the law of sin dwelling inside of us. That sin we inherited from our foreparents, Adam and Eve. Always there trying to get us to fulfill the works of the flesh. And that will keep us out of heaven. Okay? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, Paul wrote... There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. He says there's no temptation on this earth that has come upon you that hasn't come upon just about everybody, in other words. Okay? There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. He says God is faithful. He's not going to allow the devil to tempt you beyond some point that he know you can't handle. So every time me and you give in to the law of sin and fulfill the works of the flesh, that's a willful sin. Because Paul just said that God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. So it boils down to us making the choice not to sin every time we're tempted to sin. And the Lord has given us everything we need to do that. So we do not have to live a life of willful sin. Now, I am not teaching that the flesh is going to stop desiring to do wrong. Because as long as you are alive, your flesh is going to be doing that. Your flesh, my flesh, and everybody else. Okay? The only one who didn't have a law of sin dwelling in his members was our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's why he was able to shed his blood and offer his body to redeem us. But he had the devil outside of him trying to get him to sin. So we have to deal with the law of sin dwelling inside of us and the devil and his angels whispering in our minds and trying to get us to do wrong. But again, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there has no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. No matter what Satan's trying to tempt you with or no matter what your flesh is desiring, what evil thing your flesh is desiring is nothing new to God. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. So every sin you and I commit after we've been converted and after we've learned better, it's a willful sin. And it doesn't have to be because of what Paul said right here. The Lord has given us everything we need to say no, 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 no. Every time the flesh tries to get us to do something wrong. Every time the demons whisper in our mind, no, I'm not going to do that. That's why Paul would write also in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. He wrote, being guided by God's Spirit, I can do all things through Christ 
which strengtheneth me. See, Jesus will give us the strength that we need to keep the flesh in check and tell the devil to get out of our face. So, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And so can you and I. And this is what we better learn to do if we want to be saved into his eternal kingdom. Because at the end of that list of the works of the flesh, he said, those who do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so a lot of Christians who think they can just keep living a life of willful sin and go to God and say, I'm sorry, God, please forget me. And then go right back out and do it again and just keep doing that their whole life and think they're going to be saved. Uh -uh. That is not what the Bible teaches. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting at verse 24. Paul says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all? He says, But one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. So Paul says, the people who run in a race, they all get at the starting line and they all run. But only the one that comes across that finish line first, he's the one that's going to receive the prize. And so he's telling us the same thing when it comes to this life. We better be striving to please God and working out our salvation with fear and trembling and mastering walking in the footsteps of Christ if we want to make it into the kingdom. If we don't, we're not going to be there. This is what he's talking about. He's comparing it to a race. He says in verse 25, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. He says all those runners who are going to participate in that race, they are fit, they're in shape, they're disciplined, and they're ready to run. And that's how you and I have to be spiritually. He says, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Those who ran in the Olympic races during Paul time, they got a little reef made out of some leaves off of a plant from King Caesar as their reward. And he would put it on their head. That's why he says they do it for a corruptible crown. Because after a couple of days, them leaves are going to dry up and crumble and blow away. He says, but we're running for an incorruptible crown. The Lord has promised us a crown of gold for the overcomers that will never fade away. All right. Then he says in verse 26, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. Paul says, I don't run like I don't know if I'm going to win. He says, I'm certain I'm going to win because I'm giving it everything I got. I'm running to win. He says, so fight I not as one that beateth the air. He says, I fight to win. I'm not fighting like I'm shadow boxing. Now, he's just using this to illustrate how serious you and I are to take being Christians and living a holy life. He says in verse 27, that was 26, he says, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Now, the word keep and under the same Greek word, when you look it up in the Strong's Concordance, it's hupiadzo, and this is a boxing term. Paul says, I hit my body under the eye like a pugilist. It means to buffet an antagonist like a pugilist. A pugilist is a boxer, like hit punching him in the eye to take him out or to beat your body into compliance. To subdue one's passions. That's what those words keep it under me. So Paul says, I beat my body into place. I don't allow the law of sin dwelling in my members to dictate to me how I'm going to live. And now uh, it's very important that you read this because when you read about him talking about the law of sin in Romans 7, you could get the idea that he was saying, it was a fight he couldn't win, that he just gives into it. No, he was just simply describing the conflict that goes on inside of every believer between the Holy Spirit that's now dwelling inside of us and the law of sin that's in us. The Spirit is there to tell us what's right and help us do what's right. The law of sin is there to try to get us to do wrong. So here's Paul letting us know that he kept under his body. He beat his body into compliance. And the reason why he said he did that, he said, I keep under my body or I beat my body into compliance and bring it into subjection, 
lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So you could be going around saying you're a Christian all you want. You could be used by God to tell other people about the Lord. But if you're not living right yourself, you're not going to be saved. You're going to be a castaway. So that's why the Lord gives me these Bible studies to help me first. And then those that he leads to these videos because this is of the utmost importance. In most organized religion today, they do not emphasize holiness. They tell you just come in here and give a tithe, which there ain't no such thing. Because tithing never had anything to do with money. It was a tenth of the herd, the, the crop and the flock, and it was for the tribe of Levi. Anyway, that's a whole nother Bible study for another time. I got a Bible study title, Is Tithing a Practice for Today? Check it out if you don't already know these things. Anyway, they just said, give me a tenth of your money and ask God to forgive you for your sins. I'm going to pray for you and you're good to go for next week. Uh-uh. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, Starting at verse 26, Paul wrote there, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. You see that? So if we are living a life of willful sin, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, the blood of Jesus Christ ain't going to benefit us one iota. We are in a world of hurt if we're living a life of of willful sin after we have been taught better. So once you know better, you got to do better. Paul says, for if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, 27, but a certain, look at that, certain, that means guaranteed, fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversary. So the only thing we got coming, if we're living a life of willful sin, is the torments that will last for all eternity in the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone. Brothers and sisters, this is of the utmost importance. That's why the Apostle Paul would write in Hebrews 12 verse 14, he says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Holiness means living a clean life according to what God says is clean. Okay? In everything you do. And so this is what you and I should be doing every second the Lord gives us. We should be working out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Constantly asking God to strip us of the old way and help us live a holy life. And he will, and through the power that he gives us, through the Holy Spirit, we can. That's why in Romans 8, verse 1, Paul writes, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The people who are not allowing their flesh to dictate to them how they, how they live their lives, but are yielding to God's Holy Spirit inside of them and following the direction of the Spirit, those people are not under the condemnation of God anymore. I read it again. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. I'm talking about believers now who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So if you're still walking after the flesh, you are under the condemnation of God. You're not on your way to heaven. You're on your way to hell. You need to get this, saints. We all need to get this. That's why in Galatians 5, 16, Paul wrote, This I say then, walk in the spirit. Notice the word spirit has a capital S on it. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. Walk in the spirit and ye or you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. He didn't say the flesh was going to stop lusting after evil. But he says if you and I learn how to walk in God's spirit. That means follow and obey what the spirit tells us. Rely on the spirit for strength. We will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We won't commit adultery. We won't fornicate. We won't practice any kind of uncleanness or lasciviousness, or idolatry, or witchcraft, or hatred, or variance, or emulations, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envies, murders, 
drunkenness, ravelings. We won't do any of that. Our flesh might be trying to get us to do it, but if we learn to walk in God's spirit, we will not go through with it. Even if you start down that course. Now, I have to say this. Your flesh might tell you, look at that woman over there, man. Look at her breasts. Look at those hips. Look at that big old butt. Oh, look at her. Ooh, look at that, man. Don't you want that? And you're looking and you're lusting. Ooh. But then the Holy Spirit's going to say, stop. Stop doing that. That is not your wife. Cut it out. And that's when you have to decide right then and there if you're going to listen to what the Holy Ghost is telling you or the Holy Spirit or you're going to keep listening to your flesh. And if you turn away, then you just cut it off. You have not fulfilled the lust of the flesh. Same thing goes for women too. Woman might see some man with a shirt off with big rippling muscles and she's looking at him and she's getting all sexually excited and she begins to fantasize about having sex with this man and the spirit is going to come and say, stop. That is not your husband. Stop doing that right now. She has to decide right then and there if she's going to listen to what the Holy Spirit is telling her or she's going to keep looking and listening to what the flesh says. Okay? So this is what he's talking about when he says walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Got to constantly turn away from evil every day of our life. And that's why so many people are not going to make it in because they don't take this serious. You know, they figure don't nobody know what I'm thinking. Oh, you're wrong. God knows what you're thinking. And that's the one that matters. It doesn't matter if we don't know what you're thinking, but God knows what you're thinking all the time. And he knows what you do all the time. We're going to wrap this Bible study up in 1 John chapter 3. I'm going to start at verse 1. The Apostle John, the one Jesus loved the most, wrote, being guided by God's Spirit, and behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. He said, look at the great privilege that the Lord has made possible through his love, that one day we can be called the sons of God. Matter of fact, we are called the sons of God even now. He says, therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. He said, the world didn't know God and they ain't going to know you. So don't be surprised by that. Verse 2, he says, beloved, now, right now, are we the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when... He shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So right now we are considered God's children. But we don't know what a spiritual body looks like because we haven't experienced that. But when that time comes, we're going to have one just like God. That's what he says. We're going to be spiritual beings just like him, and we're going to see him as he is because we're going to be as he is. You got it? Now look at what John writes in verse 3. And every man, he means mankind, that, that's women too, every man and woman, every boy and girl that has this hope in him or her purifieth himself or herself even as he, even as God is pure. So the people who really understand this through the Spirit know that we have to ask God to help us perfect our walk and clean up our lives if we want to see him in peace. Verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law. Every time we commit a sin, we're breaking God's law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is the breaking of God's law. That's why you got to know the law. So when we break God's law, we're committing sin. Verse 5. Now look at this. And ye, or you, know that he was manifested, that is Jesus Christ, was made known to the world, to take away our sins, and in him is what? No sin. So Christ came into the world to die for our sins, to remove them. And that's exactly what he did. Our sins were transferred to Christ when he came into this world as the Lamb of God, who took away our sins. And the blood of Jesus will never lose its power. It is our only way of being cleaned up when we put our trust in that blood he shed for us at Calvary. And then we follow the Holy Spirit as he leads us in how we should live our lives.
So, you know, we don't want to leave that off. So he took away our sins, and there was no sin in him, the Bible says. So when you have some so-called preacher in one of these coats telling you that Christ was just like me and you, oh, no, he wasn't. Christ knew no sin, he did no sin, and in him was no sin. That's what the scriptures say. Verse 6, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Now look at John, going to tell it like it is. Whoever's truly staying in Christ, they don't practice willful sin. He just said it. Whosoever abides in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. If you call yourself a Christian and you're still living willful sin after you've been taught better, you're fooling yourself. You ain't got no relationship with God. You're just spinning your wheels. You're stuck in the same place. And until there's a change in that wicked practice, you are in a world of hurt. He just said, whosoever abides in him, whoever stays in God, in his son Christ, sinneth not. They don't live a life of willful sin. Whosoever sinneth, whoever is willfully sinning, has not seen God, neither known him. Seven. Little children, he says, let no man deceive you. That includes so-called preachers up there on the podium telling you that Christ understands that you're going to sin all your life. Just repent. That's a lie from the fiery pits of hell. The Bible doesn't teach that. That's why he says, little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. If you're not down here doing the right thing, and I don't mean what you think is right, but what the Lord says is right, then you have no righteousness. He wants us to be righteous like he is. Verse 8, he said, He that committeth sin is of the devil. He that willfully practice sin, let me tell you exactly what he's saying, is of the devil. You're a child of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. Satan sinned from the very beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest or made known that he might destroy the works of the devil. That's one of the main reasons Christ came, to destroy the works of Satan, to put an end to all this madness. Verse 9, that was verse 8. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. You see that? So let me translate. Whosoever has been born of God does not willfully practice sin. That's what he's saying. And, and then he tells us why. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Let me translate that. For God's spirit is inside of that person, and he or she cannot willfully practice sin because they have been born of God. The Holy Spirit is inside of us to reprove us when we're wrong. Okay, that's one of his functions. He's there to teach us and, and guide us and strengthen us too, but he reproves us every time we're wrong. And so when the Spirit tells us we're sinning and to stop, we have to make that decision to stop immediately. So we don't have to live a life of sin. Very important that we know this. And every individual needs to know this and they need to put this into practice because Jesus says there's going to be a whole bunch of folk on Judgment Day talking about, Lord, Lord, didn't I, didn't I prophesy in your name? Didn't I cast out devils in your name? And in your name do many wonderful works, Lord. And then Jesus said, and then... I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. If this particular Bible study has been a blessing to you, and you want to bless me with a love gift of any amount, this is how you can do that. I encourage you to go to paypal.com and set up a free PayPal account. And then you can also download the PayPal app. It's free. 
And if you choose to do it that way, then you would go, use this code to send me your love gift. PayPal.me slash Barton Porter. You can also download the free cash app, which is the one I prefer. And if you choose to bless me using cash app, my uh, code is cash.app slash dollar sign Barton 1014. And then there are people who prefer Zelly. For Zelly, all you need is my name, Barton Porter, and my phone number, which is 630-441-4563. And then I have videos that I put on Patreon. Some people prefer to give their money through Patreon. So if you're going to do it that way, you would go to patreon.com slash Barton underscore Porter. Now, here are non-financial ways you can be a blessing to yours truly in this ministry. I need your prayer, saints. Pray for Minister Porter and pray for this ministry. We all need prayer. And share the Bible study videos. If you're being blessed or encouraged or taught through this ministry, share these Bible study videos with as many people as possible. And if you have any Bible questions or prayer requests, you can call me at 630-441-4563. I live in Illinois, so I'm in the central time zone. Be reasonable about the times you call. Just don't call me late at night. <laughs> and if you don't have a phone, you can email me your Bible questions or prayer requests or whatever you want to send me. You know, if you just want to share a testimony or share some experience, send it to BartonAaronPorter at gmail.com. Now, these last few things are of the utmost importance, saints. I need your support. I need you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you're being blessed through this ministry, Take the time to hit the subscribe button. It does not cost you a penny. And underneath the video also, after you hit the subscription button, there's a little bell icon. Click on that bell icon. That bell is the notification icon. I release Bible study videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Every time a video is released, you will get a notification. It will let you know a new video is available. And underneath the video, there's two thumbs, one up, one down. If you like my video, if you like the content, please take the time to hit that thumbs up button. Very important. These are non-financial ways you can help this ministry. And I need your support, saints. So please do that. And last but not least, it just came to my mind. If you really were blessed by a Bible study video, take the time to put something in the comment section. It encourages me to know that my preaching and teaching isn't in vain, and God can use that to encourage somebody else to actually watch the video and see what the Bible has to say about a particular thing. So take the time to put something in the comment section. Now, in closing, these shirts that you see me wear all the time are my own designs. I have an online t-shirt store, and I just recently purchased the domain name. It's godware.store. So please go to godware.store, check out the t-shirts, the hoodies, the women tees, the cups. If you see something you like, buy it because you're getting something that you can use to share the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere you go, and you're also blessing this ministry as well. So. Until next time, this is Minister Barton Aaron Porter saying, may the good Lord continue to bless you and keep you all the days of your life. God bless you and goodbye.